Good evening, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Critique Corner with me, Daniel Parker. And me, DB Fastbinder. And, uh, you know, I often say we have an eclectic mix, but I think this is pretty damn eclectic tonight. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, good to see you, Ninja. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we... Um, uh, if you are returning, welcome back. Uh, if you're new, what we usually do is uh, we uh, do a bunch of reviews. We do a nice little mix of uh, something new or new-ish uh, and then something uh, classic or old uh, with mm -hmm. a few maybe occasionally or usually uh, uh, you know something solo that we've been watching or during the week. Um, and, uh, and yeah, Ninja, uh, I'm wearing a cap shirt uh, oh oh i haven't seen the recent trailer yet for that so i have to check that out but um but yeah but uh, but before we get into all of our reviews and everything we like to talk about the box office yes let me get my screen up all right so previous weekend um godzilla x kong the new empire was still number one in its second weekend Though a sixty-one percent drop isn't an amazing outcome. No, that's uh, that's a pretty good dip there. And if we look at uh, it's in the chart, it hasn't made a sperm whale of failure, which is where it has the tiny lower jaw beneath the trend line here on the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> but it's definitely hugging the low end of the yeah. projection. Yeah. I, th I think that this is kind of the year of mediocre movies because it's kind of a similar tale with uh, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire where it sounds like it just had a not very inspiring, uh, you know, not very yeah. inspiring script. Right, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just, um, it, it didn't, it, it, they didn't uh, uh, utilize the, the stars as well as it should have, I guess, is from what I've heard. Actually, yeah, like we bought a lot of kind of uninspiring sequels. Godzilla X, I mean, Godzilla X Kong sounds like it's basically what the first movie was, mm. or first of the Godzilla and Kong movies, I should say. Yeah. Um, Monkey Man came out to a $10 million opening. I've heard people liken it to, um, why am I blanking? J um, John Wick, but oh, I don't. Yeah. But I don't know anything about it, really. Uh, I believe Jordan Peele directed it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ninja says uh, he heard it was a uh, film focused on on the kaiju fights instead of trying to focus on the human drama. Yeah. Which, I mean, okay, so I've seen... I've actually seen all of these MonsterVerse movies except for the 2014 Godzilla somehow. Hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And let me tell you, the the human parts, the plot, are always the worst parts of those movies. Uh, yeah, because they're always they're either too goofy or they're too somber or they're just boring, and you want more monsters to show up and punch each other. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know what's funny? You say that, but it, that Godzilla twenty fourteen. That's the only one I've seen of, <laughs> <laughs> of these. <laughs> Uh, what was really funny is that when I saw the second Godzilla movie, the one where they uh, fight King Ghidorah and Mothra and Rodan shows up and is basically Megatron no. you know, before Ghidorah, like you know, just bowing and scraping. And like he doesn't say any words, but the body language is completely submissive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that one, I actually gave that plot more or gave that movie more credit than I thought it deserves in retrospect because I had assumed that the human plot was. Uh, was like characters who had been established in the first movie. No, it was in a whole new cast. Yeah. I was like, oh, so they didn't really do much. As, like they didn't really develop them as much as they wanted to because they just didn't want to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it says only uh, Kong Skull Island did the human draw did the human drama well, uh, being a sort of remake of the original. Ah, okay. Yeah, I don't know if I would call that a remake of the original. I would say it's more like. Uh, Kong with like some apocalypse now mixed in, uh, uh, like, like it, it or it's basically like the original if they never got back to New York. Oh, okay. Um, and, it, and it's set during Vietnam, so you have mm -hmm. Samuel L. Jackson as a 
obsessed like basically it's after uh they've been forced to flee south vietnam and so he and his soldiers are feeling defeated and when they end up at this place it's like it's like he's like i'm not losing again uh okay huh. yeah you're, you're right ninja that's like the only one of those where the human plot was at all interesting yeah <laughs> featured loki and captain marvel hmm. uh weirdly enough they didn't have a romantic subplot even though it felt like they should have <laughs> uh and also brie larson just has this way of talking that is unfortunately kind of annoying even though the character itself was fine yeah uh oh, it was basically commentary on a vietnam like uh rambo right yeah <laughs> But um, so yeah, uh, I, basically it's like the polar opposite of Godzilla minus one, mm. or it's like uh, at least as far as I can tell from reviews and stuff I've heard. I haven't. I, I am probably going to see this at some point, but mm. just haven't bothered yet. Yeah, Monkey Man. Uh, if that's a good opening or not, that is entirely dependent on the budget. Yeah. But it isn't great. I hope. Hopefully, it has good word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the first also, omen. Ooh. The first omen opened. Uh, I heard good things about it, but yeah. it's like a vegan hearing about a new steak shop. She's like, I don't do horror, so sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's a ninja says I found the MonsterVerse films being way more consistent in terms of quality. Film critics will never uh, like them, but they're fun. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, okay. So it's it's, it's like it's actually kind of like horror. Um, there are some genres that critics just don't like because what the critic is looking for is uh, is somewhat objective markers of quality. Where what the person who's going to shell out fifteen bucks to go see Godzilla and King Kong punch each other wants is Godzilla and King Kong to punch each other and possibly some new monsters. Right. Yeah. That that's the experience they're after, and if the movie delivers that experience, then great. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of uh, uninspiring sequels, uh, Kung Fu Panda brings in brings up the rear in the top five. That four hundred seventeen million internationally after more than a month. Not bad. Yeah, that that's got to be. Yeah, okay, an eighty-five million dollar budget, and they're they're making a little bit of profit, but. That's got to be disappointing compared to the other ones in the series. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the other ones. Let's see. Okay, wow, they made this one for less, or for a little bit over half of what Kung Fu Panda Three cost. Wow. And they're trailing it a bit. That's that mm. is interesting that they managed to shave the cost so much. I wonder if that if they that was part of the, like they're moving the uh, animation overseas. Yeah, um, or the or the the animation isn't quite as um, uh, intricate and and uh, intent and, and there isn't as much like effects in there as the other ones. Okay, so unadjusted for inflation domestically, it is the second best at this stage in its box office life. It, if, if that eighty-five million dollar production budget is accurate, this is definitely the best ROI of the series. Because wow, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, okay then. Yeah. This this is why numbers are good. Yes. Because because then we aren't dealing with the world of opinions. That yep. comes later in the show. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, then we got a one a fathom event showing of someone like you. Which didn't uh, actually hear about this one. I didn't either. Uh, this looks like a pure romance story. Uh. Yeah, yeah, Ninja. Like uh, the previous movies met were that were made like ten years ago, were having like a hundred forty million dollar budget. Yeah, which I'll say that... we reviewed three recently. Like I, I saw that budget in places. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's see. Uh, then we got Dune at, at no, number six. Uh, that one's probably going to hang around for a while. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's they haven't fallen into the trap of just dropping on an HBO Max uh, right away. 
Yep. Yeah, if it keep if they if they keep it off of there for a few more weeks, it'll probably hit seven hundred. Yeah. Which it occurred to me if uh, if Inside Out two and Deadpool don't do well, I don't think we have another real competitor contender for a billion dollar movie this year. Well, yeah. I'm trying to think of if, yeah, I, I can't think of any that would be get close to that. Certainly wasn't the American Society of Magical. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm, <laughs> no. Apparently, they've already pulled that from theaters. Uh, technically, that was like a Fox Searchlight thing, which which makes it a Disney movie. <laughs> um, rest of the top ten: Arthur the King. That I, I'd say this one's like a mild flop, unless they made it really cheap. Yeah, Immaculate. That's the nun one. Yes, with Sydney Sweeney. Mm. Yeah, still less than 15 million domestically after three weeks. But again, so apparently Sydney Sweeney uh, is like Margot Robbie in that she decided that the best way to make sure that she had roles to play was to start her own production company. Uh, that makes sense. Well, uh, well, hopefully she doesn't uh, get all, um, you know, anti male gaze like Margot Robbie did. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll be fair. Uh, if I was Margot Robbie and I'd shown as much of myself as I did in Wolf mm -hmm. of Wall Street, I'd probably uh, <laughs> and, and see people talk about me the same way that they did. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. to my knowledge, uh, Miss Sweeney, the most that she has shown off is the uh, her boobs. Yes, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and she seems to be quite comfortable with that so far, at least. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> then we've got Wicked Little Letters, which oh. Okay, this I watched a review of uh, on Film Threat. It sounded yeah. like it was one of those boring British uh, comedy of manners movies. Oh. Uh, also, also weirdly diverse for 1910 or 1920s London with like a black judge and things like that. But you'll, you'll notice when we reviewed Wonka, I didn't make one mention of that because I basically gave it the same forbearance that i would a broadway production since it was basically a broadway musical yeah yeah um yeah i did too yeah i mean uh or uh or, or even a, a high school you know uh, musical production because you know like with high schools it's like oh you know you know you, you get whatever you take what you can get you know in terms right. of who can act right you get and the same thing for like a you know broadway has a you know Who's willing to perform on Broadway? You get who you get. So it's like, you know what? I'm not going to mention this because it's not, it's not important. If yeah. you're doing just like a straight movie, it's just like, hmm. Mm, yeah. <laughs> kind of questionable. Um, yeah. So I would say if we're looking at it from the top 10 with our perspective of, uh, you know, what's out there making money? What are we going to get more of? Um, I actually don't know i have this feeling we're not going to get more ghostbusters th at this rate no which is unfortunate because yeah, the last movie set them up to uh you know take the franchise further but if you have a bad script you have a bad script mm -hmm. um we're probably going to get a dune part three i would think yeah uh, uh, yeah i would think too yeah probably be it would probably be uh dune messiah is what they would do which was the second book in the series Right, with the jihad and everything. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, the, the, while, th while things are healthier for the box office than they had been back in January and February and even most of March, it's still not amazing. Nope. So, some of these movies, like, I, I get why they had to put out these movies when they did, just because they had already kicked them back due to the, due to the strikes last summer. Yeah. But... Dang, like the, some of these, they probably should have waited till June. Yes, they should have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ghost, Ghostbusters might have done better um, if it if it had been a summer movie. And yep. uh, yeah, Ninja says uh, apparently Doom Messiah covers the aftermath of it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's when uh, yeah when Paul becomes the the uh, okay. Spoiler: If you don't know anything about Dune. Uh, Paul becomes the emperor. Gasp. Yeah. <laughs> but um, 
yeah, that you know, let's just move on from our old buddies at the box office. Uh, yes. Daniel, do we we have two animated things we're talking about this week? Do we want to talk about the silly one or the or the serious one? Uh, let's go serious first. Okay, because um, boy, <laughs> yeah, th- th- this. Okay, so I was starting to think that. You know, the, okay, the first few episodes of X Men '97 were a um, were a fluke, and we're going to get this kind of uninspired, on fast forward slop going forward. And I guess it's I guess we can't have nice things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Boy, this episode came out of left field for me. <laughs> yes, yes, me too. Yeah, um, yeah, Ninja, the show got guts. Um, <laughs> yeah, if if only because it we didn't even get. I was expecting part two of that rogue or sorry, that storm and forge story i was too yeah but then but that's not what we got we got um uh, uh you know the, the follow-up with um uh, geonosia uh becoming a part of the un or being recognized as a country by the un uh we had um we've got magneto rogue and gambit going to genosha to to celebrate this uh and it's there that they uh that Magneto is asked to be the leader of Geonosia. Yep. With, uh, and we get to see the resolution of the rogue Magneto Gambit love triangle. Yeah. <laughs> and, and weirdly enough, uh, almost a callback to the X-Men gala that they've been doing the last few years on the, oh, during the Krakoan era. Yeah, the, what but, was it? The, the Hellfire Gala. Hellfire Gala. That's it. Yeah. Only handled well. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, and they uh, and then we we got to see some returning characters there as well. Um, Malin Pryor shows up, which we're we're expecting to see her again so soon. Nope. Yeah. We got to see Nightcrawler. Yeah, Nightcrawler. That was cool. Yeah. Because <clears throat> he was he was kind of underutilized in the in the old show. Right. I, I think the reason for that was that um, so if you if you got your introduction to X-Men from the 90s cartoon, you kind of missed that they're like the, these big elements of the Chris Claremont X-Men stable, uh, specifically Colossus, uh, Kitty Pride and uh, Nightcrawler. Yeah. Who weren't around much. Uh, Colossus, I forget what he was doing in the early 90s, but I know that Kitty and Nightcrawler were on a European-based team called Excalibur, which is why they weren't in the Jim Lee stuff they were adapting. Okay. Uh, yeah, they they mentioned yeah in the uh, in the episode that he was part of some like faith-based. Uh... Right, he was there like help with the different communities of faith on the island. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, so so it seems to me that there's. Uh, couple of angles we can take here uh we'll avoid spoilers to start with uh, and then we'll get into spoiler stuff because yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh non-spoiler stuff uh this episode delves into the uh, relationships of the characters quite a bit mm-hmm. um outside of dealing with the rogue gambit which I mean, the, the rogue gambit and magneto triangle we also have some elements of the gene madeline Pryor, scott wolverine's love square uh, yeah because <laughs> <laughs> poor cyclops is just he's getting more shine in this than he did in any of the previous versions but mm-hmm. shine means suffering for for soap opera superheroes like the x-men are uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Cyclops. He, uh, um, he he can't seem to do anything right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, he's in a weird situation. Like the the woman that he married turned out to not be the woman that he married, mm-hmm. or turned out to not be the woman who who he thought he was, and so she left. But they had a kid, and that kid is now in the future, right. and and then he runs into Madeline again on the mutant island. Yes. Yeah. Um... Oh, oh, that's right. Uh, Emma Frost showed up. Yeah, it's, but yeah, at least better than cycling. Yeah, yeah. That, that man. Okay, I know. I know that people love that run of X Men, but I am not a Grant Morrison guy at all. I used no. to like that X Men run, but the more I think about it, every time I hear about something that happened in it, it's like, yeah, that was stupid. Yeah, yeah, that was stupid. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. 
Did you know that in that one, uh, they had beasts regress from being an ape person to being a cat person, sort of, which is kind of the, like he had like a lion's muzzle and stuff. Oh, um, and uh, he actually was using a kitty litter box in his lab. No. No. Which no. a villain made fun of him for. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I'm sorry. Cassandra Nova was right, Beast. Just because you get kiddish doesn't mean that you suddenly don't have to use a turlet like the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. And, yeah, Ninja brings a good point. He, he didn't know when the love of his life got switched. Yeah. Right. That's what's, that's what's got to be so terrible for him is, has it been three months? Has it been, okay, we know it was at least nine months because pregnancy mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. But, you know, how many years was it? Mm-hmm. So uh, th that was interesting to see them deal with. It. And also Wolverine being a good guy. Yeah. And knowing not to move in even when he gets the opportunity to move in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but most of the storyline is it takes place on Genosha. And um, you learn some things about Magneto in this series that really... Uh, he does not come off well. <laughs> no. Yeah. Also, um, mm. okay. Uh, so th this this uh, story is definitely carving out its own weird. It, it is its own weird continuity. I, I was talking with somebody at work about it who didn't know X Men. Yeah. I was like, I can't recommend this to somebody who didn't watch the '90s cartoon at least a little bit. But it's mm. also its weird own third continuity that isn't quite the '90s comics, and it isn't quite the uh, 90s cartoon. It's like there's own weird mishmash where they're just picking and choosing what they want from it. Right. Yeah. Um, but they managed to make Magneto's work, Magneto worse because so the, the the whole basis of Magneto and Rogue having any sort of flame at all was uh, the two of them being stranded in the Savage Land, which is a place full of dinosaurs and mutants. Yeah. Or mutates as they call them. Um, and uh, Jim Lee drawing Rogue very provocatively in there. <laughs> and that was kind of like they kind of having to lean on each other to survive in this place. In a, a, a tropical jungle in Antarctica of all places because comic books. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Daniel, how, how would you describe uh, how they have Rogue and Magneto's flashback meeting in this how, how does how does it how does it come off um uh it comes across very um me too ish <laughs> yeah that's a certain word that youtube really cracked down on a few years back uh, uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah like the way that rogue talked about their time together uh, it really came across as like a creepy old cult leader um, doing things with the uh, young girls who are brought to him. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and brought to her by Mystique. Yeah, uh, that was, yeah. Which seems out of character for Mystique to allow that to happen. Uh, yeah. But, Although uh, they did specify her evil mother. W weird that Rogue used the word evil to describe her, but... Yeah. Um. Also weird that they didn't show her as Mystique. So, since like for this continuity, it could be that it isn't. It wasn't even Mystique. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Seems unlikely, but again, the, the show keeps hitting me with, with curveballs. So who knows? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, one one YouTuber I follow, Jester Bell, uh, her whole critique about the Magneto and Rogue thing is that even outside of the age gap. There isn't really like a spark that they have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it is Mystique being a good mom. No way she's a terrible mother. Yeah, that's true. She was not a good mother. No, she abandoned Nightcrawler. Uh, Rogue, she chose because she was useful, though she did seem to have some affection for her. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a difference between, you know, being kind of a crappy extremist and uh, letting Manito have his way with your daughter of indeterminate age 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> when in this version, he is still a Holocaust survivor. So. Mm, yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. So, uh, just just generally not good. Um, yeah. But yeah, her point was that they, it seems like the only reason that Rogue would like him is, is that because he is the one person who can use his powers to touch her safely. Right. Which, like, yeah. that is very shallow. Like, mm, yeah. I understand being touch starved because of your mutant powers, but still. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Gambit got the, you know, Gambit had kind of been getting the the shaft the last few episodes in terms of screen time, but he yeah. actually got quite a bit of time this episode. Yeah. Um, and you, you could definitely tell, you know, he was not happy the entire time. This was the, the, the whole thing. This whole thing was going down with Rogue and Magneto. Right. I mean, yeah. you, you even had, um, they actually kind of did Rogue a little dirty there because they had, when Rogue was explaining why she was, attracted to Magneto to Gambit. Uh, you kind of got the impression that he, like, of all the people, he was the one willing to have the connection without the touch, and Rogue was like, nuh-uh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, and, and, um, it just, yeah, it was, it was really, uh, yeah, it, it kind of, like, I, I, me personally, I'm not a big fan of love triangles. It's just kind of a, it, it because you're 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 basically because one of the characters in there isn't going to come off very well, <laughs> and then and in this case it was probably Rogue. Yeah, like the, you know, say what you will about the whole like harem protagonist thing. Usually with those, it's like it has the most understandable love triangle part, which is the main character not wanting to make a firm choice and uh, hurt somebody's feelings. Right. Yeah. Uh, here it's very it's very clear that um, yeah you're right like there is no way to have a love actually no the the love triangle between uh, Wolverine Gene and Scott mm. is probably the best case scenario for it where it's like there's an unrequited love that um, Wolverine has for Gene that just can't be yeah and he knows that it can't be but he still has an affection for her and cares for her so it's yeah. uh, that's probably about your best case scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just says, um, yeah, Gene gets hit with a bad image. Yeah, yeah. That that was also from that Grant Morrison run. Oh, okay. Well, um, Grant Morrison didn't. Uh, you know what? I'm. It's been a long time since I read those Grant Morrison comics, but in retrospect, they're not. They're not good. Uh, no. No. At least no. they're very consistent. Mm. Um. But you know, it does seem like at the party that Rogue is going for Magneto. But then she, they, they dance centrally. But then they have the they have the freak out or the freak out, the fake out where uh, she yeah. said that she can't be with him. Yeah, yeah, because um, uh, they uh, Magneto wants her to basically marry him to be like be his queen, be his queen. Yeah, because because she's a member of the X Men and it looks better if. Because you know, having Magneto running Genosha, you know, a, a former bad guy wasn't a very good look. No, uh, so having an ex woman at his side was uh, was a good look for him. Yes, yeah. Although nothing else about this was a good look for Magneto. Like, <laughs> no, he, he, he got a lot of shine in episode two, but dang, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. not good for him. No. Hey, um, and that's where the non-spoiler part of the review of the actual storyline can end. Um, now, as far as like a production standpoint, there are times where the animation is a bit herky-jerky for my taste. Like, I don't like dropped frames. Yeah. But they definitely were saving their effort for, like, the action scenes were gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they continue their fun with uh, using the powers in creative ways. Like in one scene, they're being attacked and uh, they're going, like, Gambit's gotten a motorcycle and he's going along, and Rogue is, Rogue picks up a large object to shield them after she notices that he almost gets shot a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nightcrawler, as he's moving around and teleporting around, is just, that's just beautifully animated. The effects are amazing. Yeah, yeah, I, I was 
Yeah, I was I was really surprised by that when I saw it. I went, wow, they did a really good job with him. Yeah. Yeah, like actually, yeah, Nightcrawler comes off well as a character. He feels like himself. He, uh, yeah, like, you know, aside, okay, aside from Magneto being kind of uh, pervy and Rogue being kind of um, there. <laughs> there, yeah. <laughs> it's probably the nicest way to put it. Because like, the thing is that Rogue is, uh, like, while she has her insecurities, Rogue I see as being a much more dynamic character than that. Yeah. Her being kind of the uh, will they, won't they, love triangle pivot point isn't uh, it isn't a natural place for her. No, it isn't. Yeah, yeah. She's she's meant to be more of the of the tragic character. Yeah, right. Like where she like she knows what she wants, but she can't have it. Yeah. yeah. Um, like I would almost say that the better love triangle would have been to have somebody making a play for Gambit and her being insecure about her powers preventing her from taking things physically. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, like like Emma Frost maybe. Yeah. Like Emma Frost making a play for Gambit and but you could only use really maintain that for an episode cuz you know, they like, oh, shit, you know get you know you you know you're the only girl for Gambit. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um but yeah, uh production standpoint uh Again, characterization, most of the characters come off well. You got Magneto, old pervert, rogue, um, kind of indecisive, and that hasn't been fixed so far this show. No, no, it hasn't. She, she did make a decision at the end, but uh, we'll get into the outcome of that now. Uh, spoiler alert. Spoiler, 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 spoiler. <laughs> so, um, uh, thank you, YouTube, for informing me that uh, the critique corner podcast is going <laughs> and we wonder why our numbers are down <laughs> yeah but um okay so speaking of grant morrison they adopted one of his early runs from his x-men cartoon uh, run or early stories from his x-men run uh i forget the name of the storyline because it's been 20 years since i read it but hmm. basically a giant three-headed sentinel shows up and uh starts slaughtering genotians yeah <laughs> yeah so um uh yeah they're they're all at the ga the, the gala and then malin Pryor's there and then she gets a visit from cable who shows up from the future and trying yeah. ineffectually to stop the like to get everybody to run away to stop the attack yeah but he was just a a little little too late um but although they, they have a little nice moment where madeline realizes that that's nathan so yeah Oh, well, well, congratulations, future Trunks from Dragon Ball. You are no longer the least effectual time traveler in fiction. <laughs> yeah. Well done. <laughs> we, have a, we have a new floor. Yeah. <laughs> Which Daniel won't get that ninja might. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, huge, awesome, awful battle scene. Yeah. As the mutants are being massacred, yeah, and they're, they they were not pulling any punches either. <laughs> no, people were just being vaporized left and right. Yeah, lots of blood. Yeah, and, and um, uh, so then you had a, a situation where uh, the um, oh, what were they called? The Morlocks. Morlocks, thank you. Yeah, the Morlocks uh, get in trouble, and then um, they have to go save them, and then. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Magneto uh, has a bunch of them with him, but then he uh, gives us, you know, he sacrifices himself to save uh, save Rogue and Gambit, and because you know they're getting attacked, and um, and then uh, Rogue gets mad and she tries to do a to do a last Jedi on the uh, yeah. <laughs> on the, and then Gambit does a Rose Tico, except the logistics of it actually work this time. Yeah. He, he T-bones Rose with his motorcycle to stop her from going Super Saiyan and rushing in foolishly. Yes. Um, yeah. And then um, and then Gambit uh, uh, courageously sacrifices himself to take out the uh, to take out the giant sentinel, which yes, uh, Ninja, you're right. Gambit went out like a champ. Yeah. Um, yeah. He gets run through, and the Sentinel pulls him up to look at him, and he proceeds to uh, charge at the Sentinel's kinetic 
or potential energy and turns it into kinetic energy, destroying the Sentinel. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, pulling off what Magneto couldn't. Yes. <laughs> uh, the other nice detail is that Gambit going in to help save the Morlocks, with this weird continuity, I don't know if he helped Mr. Sinister kill the Morlocks like he did in the in the comics in the mutant massacre event. I don't believe he did. No, no, like there's not a, there's not a sign of it. Cause we did have a, uh, you know, Mr. Sinister showed up in episode two and there wasn't really any interplay between him and Gambit. So, yeah. But if that is in his past, it's, okay. It's one of those things where it's like, these people know the continuity so well that just choosing the Morlocks as being the people for Gambit to go um, save when it's an episode about him feeling like he has to redeem himself or something is appropriate. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ninja says uh, his theory for the later plot point is that Gambit will be revived by Mr. Sinister or Apocalypse and become his a new horseman. Hmm? That's very possible. Uh, I mean, you've already, I mean, Mr. Sinister's thing with his, with his hounds, as they called them, mm -hmm. was that he would, he would just clone new ones when one died. Uh that was actually a plot line in one storyline I read in the 90s where uh, Sabretooth was the only one of the hounds who hadn't died at some point, so they needed him because he was the only original who could actually... He either didn't have the genetic markers or he was the only one who still had his uh, soul, basically. Oh. It hadn't been mind-controlled yet. Yeah, yeah. And Ninja thinks there's a good chance Magneto's probably still alive. Yeah, that's it's possible. Yeah, yeah Gambit, Gambit, he did. Oh yeah, Gambit's dead. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, my joke at this is, congratulations, Rogue. Now you get zero love interests. You shouldn't have dithered. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you got greedy, Martin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but but overall, uh, I, I was describing my feelings about this show, and he said that uh, to a friend of mine, and yeah. he said, you know, you're, you're you just described. You're the you're the food critic and ratatouille putting the piece of ratatouille in your mouth and going like, oh right, this is why I like media. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> because seriously, this show just keeps really surprising me with how much I care about it and how hard it can hurt me and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the uh, and the the X Men classic stories they're pulling together and. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm 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 enjoying superhero media and looking forward to more episodes and curious about what will happen next and not watching it out of a weird sense of obligation to keep up with it to talk with other people about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I haven't felt this way about a TV show since probably 24. So that's been a long oh, time. Yeah, that's a long time for you. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it's different than with um, a lot of anime and manga because usually, uh, if unless you're watching a show that's being simulcast, you can go and find out what happened very easily. This is being released week to week. And so there's a lot of this could go anywhere. Yeah. This could yeah. go anywhere, really. Oh, yeah. 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 And the, it, it, yeah, Ninja says the, the name is Gambit. Remember it all over Twitter with the Gambit art. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, G Gambit was amazing this episode. This was just a yeah. great episode. Yeah. I am so glad that I was wrong because I thought that, okay, they shot their load. The yeah. stupid stuff with Jubilee and Sunspot and yeah. it's gonna that's going to be what we deal with from now on. So yeah, yeah. I have to accept we got three good episodes, which is more than I got out of WandaVision. So uh, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> but yeah. I think we said our piece on that. It, it's again yeah. just a surprisingly good show still. Yes, it is. Yeah. That being said, I will be right back. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go too. So uh, okay. dead air for a couple of minutes. <laughs> you know what? G give me just a second here. Okay. There we go. All right.
All right, I'll have to remember to cut this part out of the uh, the re the re uploads here. Uh, well, uh, at least nobody's left us, so I I appreciate that. Um, Yeah, so, yeah, I agree, Ninja. Hopefully, Rogue will learn. Will learn from this huge error. <laughs> All right, thank you for putting up with that. that yes. That's what happens when we spend too much time talking before the show and don't get our pre-show pit stop. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. you know, uh, so we we go from the sublime to the ridiculous when it comes to animation. Yes, <laughs> because we tried out. The show Mashal, Magic and Muscle. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You were telling me about this show um, uh, last episode of the show last week, and you were saying it was kind of it was like Harry Potter meets One Punch Man. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how does that work? <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> uh, so partially, this I, I had read a big chunk of the manga a few years back, but before I losing steam on it. Um, and then the season two opening song has been going around. Uh, it's called Bling, 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 Bong or something like that. Yeah. It is quite possibly the most catchy thing you have ever heard. And it should be considered a war crime. And I hope that the uh, Japanese people are someday forced to reckon for this <laughs> that they, hor horror that they have inflicted upon the rest of the world. <laughs> bling, 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 bling. <laughs> you the best, you the best. Da, da. <laughs> oh, hopefully we don't get copyright strikes on that. <laughs> yeah, if that if that gets, I mean, if me badly singing it gets us a copyright strike, then we live in a dystopia and everything's awful. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, but you know what? Um, Mash also lives in a dystopia, so that would be appropriate, I guess. Uh, yes, because <laughs> yeah, uh, like I said, I'd, I'd read a chunk of the manga, and we and uh, while we didn't get to season two, um, we've both seen a pretty decent chunk of it now. Yeah. So Daniel, uh, tell them about the horrible dystopian life that Mash lives. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, um, so the the world that they live in is full of uh, people. Everybody uses magic. They all have like magical abilities. And the, the lines that are on their faces indicate that they have magic. Um, but uh, Mash, who is, of course, the, the, the one in the middle, lower lower down there, um, he does not have magic. Uh, and uh, to come, and of course, uh, anybody who doesn't isn't born with magic, well, um, bad things happen to them. Right. And, uh, they're they're basically uh, not considered human beings and are eliminated to uh, to basically uh, keep the gene pool genie. Y yes, um, and uh, as a, as a baby, as an infant, he was uh, adopted by uh, an uh, old guy. Who, well, he was middle aged at the time, but now he's old. Um, and they live out in the woods in a little uh, house and. Uh, mash um to to compensate for his not having magic um he just weight trains and and fight trains and you know just <laughs> and eats cream puffs and eat and eats cream puffs yeah <laughs> uh oh, so it's the world of cross ange oh not quite <laughs> not quite as um um horrific um and, uh, yeah, yeah, except for that, the jet, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so one day, Mash, who is just he's kind of a simpleton, yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> a very sheltered simpleton, uh, he decides to go into town to get these special cream puffs. And you see how ridiculously strong he is because uh, he doesn't understand pushing and pulling the door. Like, I forget, if I push or pull. I guess I'll try to push. He breaks the door off the hand. <laughs> He's like, oh, sorry, Dad, I'll fix it. He's just putting mash in it. You're trying to put it up. <laughs> <laughs> try, try. He, he would fail that test where you try to put the right shape into the right hole. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so he goes into town, and he gives the guy the coins to pay for his cream puffs. 
<laughs> it he is accidentally squeeze. Oh, oh, sorry, I always squeeze these things too hard. Let me fix it. He proceeds <laughs> to unbend. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, and then as he's in town, uh, his he's wearing a hood, which is obscuring his face. But then the wind blows it off, and then everybody sees that he doesn't have a, a line on his face, so he doesn't have any magic. <laughs> and so the police come after him, uh, and really cruel police. Like the the police officer is shown torturing somebody, and he's only interrupted when he finds that there's a magicless freak in town. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then the resolution is very strange because Mash shows up to save his father from these people using his sheer raw physical strength to overcome their magic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the the villain must roll a 20 on his persuasion check because he, he basically goes, well, look, uh, you know, now that the police know that you're, if everybody knows that you don't have magic, they'll never stop coming for you. You'll never have a moment of peace. But I know a way you can get in. Uh, if if you uh, go to this magic school and you become the the scholar champion or whatever they call it for the year, uh, yeah. you'll be so powerful that no one will be able to touch you. And if you let me be your corrupt per person, I'll <laughs> I'll help you out, get into the school and everything. It's like, <laughs> yeah, this seems like an awful deal for Mash, but <laughs> it's basically the only way to get the fuzz off his back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, so he shows up, and and basically the uh, basically Hogwarts. Uh, I think it's it's called Easton. I think Easton Academy is the name of that, it. That sounds right. Yeah, it, I I think they kind of named it after uh, Eaton uh, Academy, which is a very prestigious private school in England. Uh, that's where uh, that's where William and Harry, the the princes, that's where they went to school. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm assuming they went through the same exact uh, tests to get in, like you know, having to get through a hedgerow maze with living sphinxes that are trying to attack you, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Mash just brute forcing his way through literally everything. Like it, it's great. Like yeah, he has a test where it's like, oh, you have to uh, use your magic to unscramble the letters on the page, and the letters are constantly moving around. <laughs> Basically, just looks down. Yeah, he's like, stop yeah. moving. <laughs> I said, stop moving and get in the right order. And then yeah. he, he scares the magical letters into position. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, uh, and of course, when he's going through the hedge maze, that's when he meets uh, Lemon, who's the, the girl. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the best way to describe the supporting cast in this show Okay, so this is already a weird Harry Potter silly parody with weirdly grim elements to the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like the side characters, from what I've read of the manga, it's basically like the author making fun of you for reading the same tropes in Shonen Jump over and over and over again. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Lemon is just like, the most basic archetype for a unwanted romantic interest I think I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, and then uh, you got the uh, then you had the the bully character who shows up in the second episode, who, so, who looks so clearly uh, Draco. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The te uh, older teenage version of Draco Malfoy. <laughs> <laughs> and and Mash is just so like agreeable that he doesn't realize he's being bullied for a while because what, what how does he know? Uh, yeah, he, he just thinks this is ordinary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then he he stands up to the to Draco and he and then uh, he slams his head into the ground and he says, "Oh, I think I screwed up." <laughs> Oh yeah, I screwed up. And then the vice principal shows up, and because the the vice principal and the and the the bully kid are like you know like friends, or they know each other, and then so he just buries them, <laughs> buries them in the floor. Yeah, and Ninja brings up a good point. It sounds like the world, if the world of Harry Potter, but with, with an isekai protagonist whose special skill set that is ordinary that breaks the world magical system. Yeah. Because he basically brute forces his way into pretending to have magic, it, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's uh, I can't remember. Was it the third episode with the where he's do, they're doing basically playing Quidditch? 
Yes, like he, yeah, like, well, they start they start the game at the end of the third episode. Oh, that's third. Okay, it was the end. Of the third. Uh, okay. But like, you know, they, they have broom training, and so you, you have to like hold out your hand and summon your broom to your hand. Yeah, <laughs> and he can't do it. But what he does is he stomps the ground so hard that the broom just shoots straight up into his hand. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, when it's time for him to pretend to fly. Uh, he, I forget, did he, he didn't just leap, like he threw the broom ahead of him, then accelerated and jumped on top of the broom. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> and, that, and thus broke the records for broom flying in one, yeah. one go. Yeah. <laughs> Which, um, so I, I watched a power scaling video for a character from Dragon Ball, the original one called General Tao, who does something similar, where he would break off an enormous pillar, throw it, and ride it around. Uh. <laughs> um, and uh, the the power scalers claim that to do that, he would have to be able to move at Mach 20 to catch up with the pillar once he threw it at the rate he was throwing it. Yeah. <laughs> so it gives you an idea of just how broken Mash is to pull off the same trick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so that's basically the gag of the show is like it's a it's a piss take on shonen manga tropes. <laughs> with a with a layer of Harry Potter parody and some surprisingly hard battles at, and cool battles at certain points. Yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, it's it's um it, it, I I I really like stuff like this that's that is very like tongue in cheek. Like like you're in on the game, like the audience is in on the gag. Like, okay, yeah, we know what you're doing, we know what's going on and but we you still enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a it takes a deft hand to pull it off. Um, mm -hmm. That's your other things. Uh, so I forget his name, but did you, Daniel? Did you did the show get to? So I read more of the manga. You watched more of the show. Did they get to that redheaded character and the stuff that you watched? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What, is it just me or is he basically just off-brand Naruto? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Kroger brand Naruto. Yeah. <laughs> and the and the, the the guy with the 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 blue hair. Uh, he yeah he has a, 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 a he's major siscon. Oh, that's him. Okay, and he yeah. has uh, he has two marks, so he's extra magic. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Overall, Mashal is a good silly ride. I, I would say that it's better as an anime than as a manga because you get the um, you get Mash's uh, not you know, emotionless deadpan deliver on everything. Yeah, oh, yeah, hey, yeah. sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I knew you were cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it's a recommend. It's, it's on over at Crunchyroll. Yes. Yeah. If you're interested in the manga, it's available on uh, their... It's available on Viz's uh, Shonen Jump app, too. All right. All right. Cool. But um, speaking of older content... Because while the second season came out, we're mostly talking about the first one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you muted at the wrong time. <laughs> Darn it. Did I, did you, so the cough was audible, but my words were not? Yeah. Darn it. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. Um, so we haven't done this where we kind of were uh, midnights edging it for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought this was interesting because it tied into a into my own gaming experience recently. Um, so, Daniel, uh, you know how about 10 years ago, everybody decided they wanted to be the next... Um, oh, what's the name of that one space game? Mass Effect? No. Not Mass Effect. Um, um, the no, one Man's, that the, no Man's Sky. No, the, 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 the it was the uh, Destiny. Uh, well, everybody Destiny. wanted to be the next Destiny. Like yeah. Everybody wants to have that... That um, e that forever game where you just keep coming out with new content for Fortnite or for Minecraft or for Roblox, mm, yeah, and uh, you capture an audience who just wants to keep coming back and playing the same thing. Well, guess what? It worked. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, this is probably explaining the failure of things like the last um, the, the last Saints Row game, Row game, and the. Um, and Suicide Squad killed the Justice League and things like that because there's only so many hours in the day for your forever games, right? Yeah. But uh, so so interesting things. Uh, the co the combined console and PC gaming market 
made about uh, $93.5 billion in revenue last year, wow. which with mobile, mobile is probably easily, would easily double that, but there, you know, it's a different market. So it's, yeah. Um, see if the market, while the market itself grew by 2.6% in 2023, the majority of playtime was spent on established titles rather than newer releases. The report's Shocking. findings reveal a striking statistic. Just 66 titles accounted for a staggering 80% of all playtime in 2023. Wow. What's even more telling is that 60% of this playtime was dedicated to games six years or older. Mm. <laughs> so... And also, a lot of the time that was for new games was from annualized games like Madden or NBA. So do, do those really qualify as new games? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Only 8% of playtime was devoted to new, non-annual releases such as Diablo 4 or Baldur's Gate 3, mm. which I am currently working on. Just, uh, well, th this ties into my own gaming experience recently where I dusted off Dragon Ball's Universe 2 because I realized that to my shock, a game that came out in 2016 had been updated with characters and transformations from Dragon Ball Super Super Heroes from 2022. Yeah. <laughs> Which is part of what got me thinking about this. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm picking this game off that I haven't played for a long time. And mm. why hasn't there been a Dragon Ball Universe 3? Because it's not like this Universe 2 is unsuccessful, considering that one of the items I got for picking the game up on Xbox. I played on a PC originally, but I wanted to play it on console instead. Yeah. Um, but I got it. I got the special item, which was these glasses that represented 10 million unit sales on a silly Dragon Ball. Uh, make your own original character do not steal time travel game. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, why would they bother making a Dragon Ball's Universe three and making the uh, the huge established install base start over, and possibly fragment things and not have them join them? Yeah, because <laughs> for what the game is, the game looks perfectly fine. Mm. The systems are mostly intact. I think some of the more broken moves that I used to use to cheese the computer have been patched a bit. Uh. <laughs> Um, you can, you don't, you can, you don't just, your character can go super saiyan just like before, but now if you unlock it, and that's what I'm working on right now, you can also go super saiyan God. So mm. it's like when I last played it, you couldn't do that. It's like, oh, okay. Cause I thought, okay, well they had the new movie where they introduced the super saiyan blue God stuff and, uh, yeah, they have Goku and Vegeta with that, but they're never going to open that up for the players. That turned <laughs> out to be wrong. Because oh. I had, I had assumed it was going to have a, a normal development cycle of being abandoned after a few years. Yeah. <laughs> and this is happening more and more. Uh, where just once, you know, like, con we don't really have console generations anymore. Like uh. Xbox One, Xbox Series, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5. Yeah. Basically the same console, just with, uh, you know, upgunned um interiors but you know the actual yeah. software is the same yeah yeah um i i watched a your boy zach video where he was playing the most the last arkham knights game mm. and they now have dlc to play as robert pattinson's batman that doesn't surprise me it's a it surprised him when he found out that uh well, considering that, uh, considering that it was like a seven-year gap between when that game came out and when the movie came out, yeah. So it's like, no wonder AAA gaming is in trouble. Considering that you you managed, congratulations, a few people managed to establish their forever games, and everybody else is competing for scraps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then this is um, uh, the only games I he, he bought and planned to play was uh, Unicorn Overlord. Overlord, and I never heard of that one. Uh, 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 that one's interesting. It, it's kind of a I, I, my friend of mine was showing it to me. Uh, it's kind of a um, 
Oh, what's that one Nintendo game series with Marth and everything? Um, never, I've never played it myself. Um, Fire Emblem. Oh, Thank Fire you. Emblem. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a Fire emblem -y type of game where, it, where it's like a, it's sprite-based and you have units that you set up and send them into battle with you the, and they, they auto battle. Mm. Okay. But it's very <laughs> slick looking. Um, and so I, and I was just thinking about my own gaming experience. I mean, last year, my, my top games on Xbox, I played, um, well, it was, uh, uh, let's see, my top three were persona five, which was a new game last year, but it was, you know, remake of a game from 2016 originally. So, yeah, like, was it really a new game? Uh, then, then next up was Mech Warrior Five, which was several years old at that point. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Vampire Survivor, which is also an old, like a couple years old. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they've managed to. It's 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 gee, it's like somebody should have, could have told them, hey, when you make it so that people want to, like, when every game is designed to be all right to play for like long periods of time. Yeah, you're not going to have people really like jumping in to buy every new release shocking i know uh, yeah <laughs> I, I guess all i can say is that congratulations game industry you played yourself yeah <laughs> yeah um yeah then it doesn't seem to be getting any better unfortunately um with, no. you know like i think was it xbox that had to uh I think it was Xbox that had to lay off uh, a bunch of people. Uh, basically, at this point, everybody's had to do big layoffs. So PlayStation just had to lay off like 900 people. Okay. Yeah. I mean, part of it is that they over-purchased when they... It's like it, during uh, during pandemic, they decided that it was going to be like that forever. So mm -hmm. you need to be ready for a life where everybody has to live inside all the time. Yeah. And Ninja's hoping Hellblade uh, 2 will be good. Yeah, too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that's a good game for everybody. Uh, I will say that um, it's irrelevant to me since I don't have a PlayStation. So, mm. <laughs> but that's all. Basically, all I had to say was that uh, I've, I've. It seems like other people are in the same category as me, where occasionally, rather than learning a new game, it's just like, yo, I hear there've been some updates for this one. Let's give this one a shot. Yeah. Wait, oh, okay. No, I, I, I'm sorry. Hellblade Two is the, that's the Norse one, right? Yeah, uh, Hell Divers is the one I think you're thinking of. Actually, I was thinking about that one with the Korean player with or model. Oh, the, oh, um, uh, Stellar Blade. Stellar Blade. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I, 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 I may get a PS5 just so I can play that. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to give us a uh, a thorough review, Tom or uh, Daniel. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I will. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, speaking of, of Daniel giving something a thorough review, yes, uh, Daniel has his solo thing of the week. Yeah, so um, uh, this movie's been on my radar for a little while, and so I, I thought I'd finally give it a watch. Um, and that is the the autopsy of Jane Doe. <clears throat> um, this is a uh, I guess I would describe it as a supernatural horror. But um, it uh, it doesn't start out that way. Um, it actually starts out more like a murder mystery. Um, so the the movie begins. Uh, there's a, a triple uh, triple homicide in a in a house in a little town in Virginia, uh, and they're trying to figure out like you know how how this family died. You know who killed this family, and uh, one of the the sheriff's deputy notes that. You know, there was no sign of forced entry in the house, and it actually looks more like the people inside were trying to get out rather than someone trying to get in, um, which that gets explained at the, at the end of the movie why that was. Um, then, uh, then they go down to the basement, and then that's where they find Jane Doe uh, buried under the under the floor. Uh, she's you know, like complete, you know, she's completely naked and there's, you know, there's nothing, she doesn't, there's nothing with her that can identify who she is. And then we, uh, then we meet, uh, the Tildens, uh, 
Tommy, the father, and Austin, the uh, the son. Uh, and from, from here on, I'm just going to refer to him as the father and the son. Um, and uh, the father is played by Brian Cox, uh, who uh, you'd recognize re recognize him if you saw him. He was he's like one of these real pro prolific character actors. Um, he played out. He played Colonel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He was Colonel Stryker in X Men Two. Um, and then uh, Emil Hirsch plays uh, plays the son. Uh, he's been in a lot of different movies. Um, I remember him from Lone Survivor. He played uh, Danny Dietz in that. But um, but anyway, so uh, they're, they're, you got a father and son um, morticians or coroners, and uh, then uh, you know the the son uh, the son's girlfriend shows up, and they're going to go off to a movie. But then the sheriff arrives with the with the Jane Doe, and the father is going to do the autopsy on her uh, by himself while the son, you know, goes off with his girlfriend. But then the son decides, well, you know, I think I'll help my dad out with the, with the autopsy and tells his girlfriend, Hey, come back later in the night. You know, we should be done by then because the sheriff needs uh, a cause of death by the, by the morning. So they immediately start doing the autopsy and they, they find that just nothing makes any sense with her. You know, they, they see like, you know, they don't see any obvious uh, wounds or anything on the body. Um, you know, her, you know, there's no signs of like any rigor mortis. Uh, but at the same time, they look at her eyes. And if you see her in the poster, her eyes are really gray, which is what people's eyes look like when they've been dead for a long time. Um, but uh, they do note that uh, her, her wrists and her ankles are broken. Uh, yeah, and uh, and her tongue's been cut off, and it, uh, so so immediately, like the the father thinks, uh, you know, that might be some kind of like trafficking thing because he's seen right. that kind of thing before, and and there is uh, obvious signs of um, SA, so they're like, okay, well, you know, that might fit, but then, but then as soon as they they cut her open, they they find that again nothing makes any sense you know her her lungs are are burned up like she's been in a fire there's like scar tissue all over like her heart and you know stomach and everything so yeah they're just just completely baffled and then they find that like a flower inside like a real poisonous flower i can't remember what it was called um oh and the other thing too is they they look under her fingernails and toenails and there's uh peat underneath it yeah it's like she was thrown into the swamp or something. Well, well, that's that's what they're trying to figure out because they're like because peat only grows because uh, they're in Virginia and peat's you know mm -hmm. like up in New England, right? Because that that's the kind of cold, moist environment, right? Yeah, and so uh, so they they find all this out, and then they also find a shroud on there with a bunch of like uh, drawings and pictograms and writing on it and they're just like okay we, they have no idea what's what's going on and then then it gets really weird when they they actually look under her skin and the, the same writing that's on the shroud is all over the inside of her and so they're just like okay and then and that's when it turns into a super supernatural horror because then weird stuff happens starts happening everywhere like they listen to the radio and you know they hear like a newscaster coming on giving a weather report of, oh this is a real bad thunderstorm we're getting a lot of rain and da 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 and and then uh and he says well one thing is certain you're in, uh, you are not leaving that place and the son kind of looks at the radio like what <laughs> 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 and uh yeah so yeah so and then like you know like the you know it's it's, it's kind of the tip kind of like a lot of the tropes of this stuff like the lights are flickering on and off and then you know then like the power goes out and of course they, they can't you know, the power goes out so and the only way for them to get out is by this elevator uh and of course they can't get up there because there's not enough power for them to get up in the elevator so and when does the body admit, inevitably start moving around on its own it doesn't really okay no. uh but but the other bodies in the morgue start moving around on their own um 
and so yeah so they're just like so the, the father and son are just like freaking out they're trying to figure out like okay well we got to get out of here they can't get out of there and it's this this body is just screwing with them and then uh so like a little spoiler here um they when they uh they finally decide okay they do a little more they go back to the body and do, of course they try to like burn the body first of all they they try to take the body to the to the crematorium but then they can't get out of the out of the exam room so they're like okay well screw this so the son grabs some rubbing alcohol and douses her and rubbing alcohol and then the father lights some matches and light them on fire lights are on fire but the body doesn't burn so they're just like what the heck and um so then they finally just well they they uh they finally look at her brain and they get a little slice of her brain tissue and they look at it and there's still activity in her brain cells. So she's still alive. The hell? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, uh, but then, then they look at the shroud again and then they realize they there's a, actually a Bible verse written on it. It's uh, Leviticus from Leviticus about, uh, you know, uh, witches and, uh, you know, not, not, uh, you shall not suffer witches to live or whatever yeah yeah and uh and then that's when the son realizes oh this girl is from the salem witch trials she was one of the people witches from the salem witch trials and but then the father's like well there weren't actually witches there you know it was just a bunch of girls you know accusing each other uh but then they the original out. cancel culture yes yes um but uh, but then they kind of say, well, maybe they did some ritual on one of these girls and it actually turned her into a witch. So that's basically what happens with that. And then um, I, I won't I won't mention what happens to them. But uh, but yeah, it's it's a um, very interesting little uh, psychological thing, supernatural psychological thing going on here. And obviously there's a, you know, obviously the mystery of like, well, you know, what's, what's up with this, this dead girl? Why is, you know, why is this weird stuff happening all around them? And, um, I, I will say it, it is very intimate, obviously, cause it's just in this one area. I kind um, of a bottle show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it's, I mean, if you, if you're into like, uh, if you're it, it's also not that um surprisingly not that well there there's like one part in there that's kind of bloody but it's really not all that violent it's it's very it's more um it, a problem i have with a lot of modern horror movies and this this movie kind of fell into that trap is uh over over reliance on jump scares mm. and there's quite a quite a bit of that in this um and uh in in fake jump scares too there were like two or three fake jump scares and it's just like okay come on um it, it, jump scares don't get me that much um I, i'm not sure why i guess because i know that something's coming <laughs> like i would say like, jump scares get me but i'm more annoyed than in, like okay you got me it, yeah, yeah. It, you know, it's like if somebody walks up to you goes right in your face it's like okay yeah you made me jump what of it is yeah this some accomplishment <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh i will say the only jump scare that ever got me was there was one in uh the original nightmare in elm street that kind of got me that did get me the whoa okay um but other than that yeah not really yeah i'm like even more annoyed by him but uh but i mean this uh i, I thought it had it in there had an interesting little this movie had an interesting little twist um and uh not the I'm not the biggest fan of the ending, but I kind of understand why they did it. And um, in in a typical horror movie fashion, they they kind of left it open for a sequel. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like one happened. Now, when I was doing a little bit of searching a minute ago, uh, one of the top results was the autopsy of Jane Doe two, and I was like, well, did they make a sequel to this thing? And no, it's just lots of people speculating online that. Oh, it, sh it deserves a sequel. It should have a sequel. What would a sequel be like, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Well, this this came out in 2016, so I, I think the yeah. Uh, the yeah the chances of there being a sequel are probably very slim to none. Probably getting closer and closer to a remake rather than a sequel. Yeah, yeah. But um, 
but yeah, it, and and also too, if if you don't, um, if you're not squeamish with you know like autopsy stuff, and you don't, and, and you're it, seeing a a dead naked woman on a on a metal slab doesn't make you uncomfortable. I mean, you know, it's it's certainly um, certainly worth a watch. You know, I I think if, especially if you like horror movies, um, I I know there are quite a few horror movie fans that enjoyed this movie, so. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you definitely painted a picture of uh, an interesting mystery buildup. So yeah. it sounds like it's at least clever, although it sounds like they didn't quite stick the landing. Uh, no, it, it kind of, yeah, it, it, it kind of gets a little weird in a few places. But yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's all right. It's not bad. Um, it's on, uh, I watched it on Shudder, but, uh, if, but if you don't have Shudder, it's also on Netflix. So. I think slightly more people have Netflix and Shutter. Just a few more. Uh, yeah. I think just a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, all right. Well, uh, uh, th thanks for sharing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I am trying to think of a trying to think of a bridge to the next thing, but. Uh, well, the sting. Yeah. <laughs> the sting. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes you just got to know when to fold them. Yes. <laughs> so, Daniel, uh, we were looking for a thing to review last week uh, that would qualify as a classic. And I think you, I, w this was your suggestion, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have I, you ever I, seen this before? I've seen it once about 20 years ago. So it had been a while, um, and the re the reason for that is because uh, this is one of those movies that you see it once, and, and you watch it again, you kind of remember, you, you start to remember everything that happens, and it's like, it's not really that big of a surprise. Sort of like The Sixth Sense. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I, I figured it, it had been long enough before I had, I had seen this movie that you know, I thought, well, I'll get, well, we should give it another watch. And you had never seen it, so, you know. Yeah, you know, I, I can't think of a Paul Newman uh, movie I'd ever actually seen before. I mean, I'm sure there had to be some, but nothing that really stuck to him. Uh, nothing really came to my mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I guess, I, guess I, I think of him as the salad dressing guy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, so I take it you hadn't seen Butch and Sundance. Nope, no, I have not. Oh, all right. That that made me another one we we got to do a review on, um, uh, all which was also but but yeah yes both of those movies Paul Newman and Robert Redford are is also in both those movies and in, in this movie and in Butch and Sundance but um but yeah so um so the Sting takes place in uh, 1936 uh, and we first meet uh, Robert Redford's character. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. Yeah, we could just call him Robert Redford. Robert, okay, yeah. So uh, uh, Robert Redford and uh, his two uh, two accomplices uh, basically grift uh, this um, uh, delivery uh, boy out of uh, or delivery guy from out of uh, about eleven thousand dollars in cash. Yeah, from a from a bookie outfit nearby. Yeah, um, and and of course. 1936, $11,000 was a lot of money. A big deal. A big deal, yeah. Um, and so, uh, and, and one, of, uh, one of the partners is Robert Earl Jones, the father of James Earl Jones. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Um, and uh, so uh, the, the, the guy who runs the bookie place uh, is... Uh, is Basically, an Irish gangster named uh, Lonigan, Lonigan, yeah, Lonigan, uh, who's played by uh, Robert Shaw, uh, who most people remember as the the uh, boat captain from Jaws, um, okay. and yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, they uh, and so uh, he finds out that uh, uh, Redford and uh, you know. Uh, Robert Earl Jones, and then the, the other guy there, who who grifted them out of the money, uh, he sends some guys to to rough them up, and 
unfortunately, uh, Robert Old Jones's character ends up uh, getting killed, and so uh, Redford gets really mad, uh, and then he uh, he seeks out uh, a friend of uh, Robert Old Jones, uh, uh, who's played by Paul Newman. Yep, to uh, to set up a revenge scheme. Yes, and. Uh, so there's a few things you learn about uh, Redford's character very quickly. Uh, he's a very impulsive young man. Mm -hmm. uh, he gets his three thousand dollars worth of share from their uh, grift of you know, that that got them eleven thousand, mm -hmm. and uh, he decides that he just he's going to go just bet it all in one game of craps, or not uh, craps, roulette, uh, roulette. Uh, roulette, yeah, uh, to impress a girl he likes, and the fix is in, and he loses. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and he just shrugs it off and she's just so angry at him for wasting three thousand dollars and like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then um then he, he also runs afoul of the local police. Um uh, God, I can't remember the actor's name, but uh, uh but yeah. was that Charles Durning's character? Yes, Charles Durning. Yeah, thank you. Um <clears throat> and uh I might have a cheat sheet up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, and uh, so he he finds out about um, you know him Griffin the bookie, and uh, wants wants a cut, and uh, so then Redford gives him uh, gives him a bunch of counterfeit money. <laughs> yeah, which uh, the, boy he 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 uh, you know he, he is the crookedest of cops. Uh, they they actually very much very much true the time where the FBI was like the agency that was actually willing to deal with crime. And it's like, we, do, we don't dare let the local cops know about this because they'll warn them. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> they're on the take. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Redford is a very, um, he's a young impulsive man. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and he talks and he doesn't, uh, like he has enough money with that to retire that's actually what uh that's actually what his partner wants to do is he's you know right. my brother owns a trucking outfit down in kentucky so i'm going to go down there and buy half of it from him and it'll be a honest life from here on out right yeah uh, what's funny is that uh, the guy's wife is very open about how uh you know into gambling she is uh yeah and and, um, and yeah. the grift and everything right yeah like, like like their son is listening to the radio oh they're gonna get Matt machine gun kelly whose side are you on uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> as she turns off the radio yeah yeah um yeah yeah that yeah the 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 yeah, the old guy getting yeah the Robert Earl Jones getting uh, getting killed right before he's get, about to get out. It's the old trope of the the cop who gets yeah. killed one you know two days before retirement. Yeah. Just just from the other side. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Paul Newman's character. Uh, it's interesting. Like, so Jones is uh, so Robert Jones's character talked about him as being like a master of the Big Short, and oh yeah, I could never do the Big Short because who's going to trust a fellow of african descent right enough yeah. to do the big short yeah uh they actually used a much harsher word uh <laughs> that i'm not going to use here uh, yes yeah this, this was the 1930s yeah <laughs> film and filmed in the 1970s when they uh yeah. Yeah. were slightly more willing to use those terms yeah yes yeah but um so newman is uh very much washed up it's interesting that he's washed up considering how quickly he turns it around as soon as he has an opportunity to pull the big short again, or the big sting again. Yeah. Um, well, well, I think uh, 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 having a, mu a mutual friend dying that in the way that, that he did, I probably spurred him a little. Right. He can, you know, he was basically an, an alcoholic um, who it seemed like the only job he was doing was he was in charge of maintaining a merry-go-round. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I was yeah. in the same building as a speakeasy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, so, th so the scheme that they pull, the scheme that they concoct to do is uh, is very interesting because, well, first off, uh, in a season six episode of King of the Hill, Peggy Hill tries to do this to a character who had conned her, which is very funny to see, to, to realize in retrospect that she was trying to pull this off in the 90s. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> When it would make absolutely no sense for that to work, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The yeah the 
the the con they're pulling the yeah uh, they pull in this wouldn't work uh yeah because of you know the little thing like the internet and you know right even in the 90s the the logic behind this the uh the opportunity for the scam wouldn't really work because okay so first thing they do uh paul newman's uh big moment in the movie is when he pretends to be a he, he pretends to be a drunk asshole gambler who shows up and buys his way into Lonigan's weekly game on the on this one particular train? Yeah, and uh, he out cheats him. Yeah, <laughs> and things you know, Lonigan can't say, "Hey, you were cheating," because the only way he would know he was cheating is if he said, "Well, yeah, you cheated me better." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so he he's forced to pay uh, pay the money to uh, Red or to Newman. Right, and so Redford shows up and says, "Hey, you know, I, I have the old man's confidence. Uh, I know how you can. I know you can stick him and ruin yeah. him." <laughs> so, so what they, so what they do, and it's, it was like a very Ocean's Eleven early on in the movie. Yeah, as yeah. they were getting the team together, because basically they set up a fake horse track or a face a fake betting outfit. Yeah, and like they had a bunch of people coming in to be actors and. You know, pretending that they were drinking and gambling and having a good time. Like, they, they had all the old grifters like, oh, what's your thing? Oh, I, I specialize in being an Englishman. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, uh, I, I got my own clothes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do, yeah. Do you need a wardrobe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, what Redford does is he... Uh, you know, first he brings Lonigan in, you know, make a $2,000 bet because, uh, you know, bet on this horse with $2,000 and I guarantee you'll win. Yeah. And, and the reason is, is that the, now the story they tell is that uh, there is a, like a, so this is back in the day when if you were doing a horse race in a different city, you couldn't, you know, obviously you weren't broadcasting live video or even live radio at a certain distance. You were sending it over the wire uh, to like via Western Union on, by telegraph, and then the results would get rebroadcast on the radio locally, right? Right. Yeah. And so Redford's cover story is that oh, uh, 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 oh, I I have the guy who works at Western Union, and uh, there is a delay between when uh, the story gets to the radio station and when it gets to me. Right. Yeah. So I know the bet a few minutes early. Yeah, yeah, and so he, um, and they, and the other, and so they set up, um, yeah, under the yeah, the, this little basement area where the betting takes place. They've also got like the little, uh, like a corner office thing that looks at the, a drugstore, where he, that's where he calls. They call into the call the bets in for for Lonigan to say, all right, you know. Uh, this horse to to win or this horse to place yeah. and yeah ten thousand dollars and lucky strike for yeah. third place right yeah yeah and uh, yeah so they 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 play it out for uh, a couple of times and uh there and then there was one time when he tries to place a bet but then uh it, they they kind of keep him from doing it uh they they shut him out right they they keep him from putting the bet in before the race starts. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and then, and, um, then finally, then it, it all builds up to the, the last, uh, the last day when, uh, he's going to put in $500,000. Right. Which if he wins that bet, that is a ruinous amount. Yes. Yeah. Of the uh, odds that he's betting against. Yeah. And, uh, and in today's money, we're talking, that's like millions, <laughs> many millions. Yeah. Many millions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I don't think we should give away the ending because it, it it kept me guessing a little bit. Like I kind of figured out what was going on partway through it. Yeah. But uh, de definitely interesting. Um, uh, so I would say that Robert Redford. Uh, how, how did you put it when I noticed? Like he, he spends the whole movie running. Uh, what did you call him in Discord? Uh, um, uh, he was like Tom Cruise before Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, like he was running in very um like in non-athletic 30s shoes all the time uh, yeah 
Yeah, and, and, and climbing up stuff too, which was you know, I, I don't know if he if he really did that or if he had a stunt double doing that, but that was you know. yeah. Yeah, like uh, whoever was doing all that running, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he definitely did a good chunk of it himself. Like he was he, he spent most of this movie running away from people. Yeah, he he's either running away from Charles Durning or he's running away from Lonigan's people or um uh, yeah, well, yeah, one of those two. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And there's like an assassin who's after him. Yeah. Uh, and that keeps you guessing a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, um, I think the one thing that you, you mentioned it was uh, not enough, not enough scenes between Newman and Redford. Yeah. I, I would say that this, this is definitely Redford's movie more. And I kept wanting a bit more from Newman. Yeah. Yeah. Just because his character is like the experienced old hand at conning people was interesting, and I, I really enjoyed him playing the character on the train. Like that was that was nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like that part too. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other part I really like was when um, when he and Redford start working together, and uh, he takes Redford basically to to give him a makeover. Yeah, he gives yeah. him a gives him a haircut, and then he's he's sitting at the barber chair getting his haircut, and then there's a woman there, a manicurist, giving him a manicure, and he's like, "Wow, well, uh, no, no, you know, this, this is 1930s. Men did not get manicures, you know." <laughs> yeah, but then, yeah, but then he gets it, and he kind of looks at, it, he's like, "Oh, no, that's pretty nice. <laughs> that isn't bad." Yeah. I think the interesting thing about um, Redford's character, like Newman, you got the impression that with a big score, he would retire. Mm -hmm. He just had had too many bad bets, basically. Yeah. Redford was doing this for the sake of it. Like that, like early on where he gambled away all of his winnings in one night or on one throw of the, or one spin of the roulette wheel. Yeah. Like that was very much his character. Like he just, he, he's in it because he likes conning people. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's the thrill of it. Yeah, uh, I, I noticed that they very intentionally made sure that he was almost in. Uh, yeah, he only was conning other criminals. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think that's the only way you can really do a movie like this. Is uh, yeah, if you're if your heroes are criminals, you got to make the bad guys even even worse criminals. <laughs> Right, like the, the people that they con first, they're running a gambling ring, and then he's dealing with an Irish mobster who openly talks about how if he shows weakness, he's going to have to kill everybody he grew up with to <laughs> keep control. And Right, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, now, now this is in the category, if I mentioned it at work, and one of my coworkers was immediately gushing about it. No. <laughs> Like he he mentioned Lonigan by name, and you are just like, oh yeah, that was a great movie. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. This movie is very much a classic, and it's um, and it it was one of those movies that um, I think when uh, I, I I might have rented rented it on Netflix back in the mail in DVD era. Oh, yeah, you just dated yourself. I, I know, I know. Um, and uh, I did it because, and I rented it because my dad said. Yeah, my dad was like, "Well, have you seen that movie yet?" I said, "No." He said, "Oh, yeah, you watched that movie." I'm like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> and he was right. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, so this thing was made in 1973 on a budget of five and a half million. Mm. Uh, worldwide gross, according to Wikipedia, was 225 million. With and according to the numbers, it was just under 160 million in the states. Wow. To talk about a return on your investment, mind you, this is 1973 when uh, it was basically before you really had uh, things like Jaws and Star Wars make the modern box office paradigm. So it's like yeah. that was saving whatever studio put this together that year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Universal. Yeah. Yeah. This was a universal one, which you know, considering that in the 60s, like there was not a single uh, major studio that did not go bankrupt at some point because TV ate into their business. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And 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 the seventies definitely were the, the the comeback of cinema, comeback of movies. Because uh, right. yeah, like like you were saying, every every studio was going bank bankrupt, so they they basically just told all these directors, you know, just make whatever movie you want. Don't spend too much money. <laughs> I kind of feel like we're about to start. Okay, we're either going to start seeing that again pretty quick, mm -hmm. or 
the whole Hollywood system is going to collapse and we're just going to have a bunch of independent markets pop up all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think so too. Yeah. Well, well, we'll see which one happens. Yeah. But, but uh, uh, yeah, back to the sting itself. Uh, it was a good time. Uh, yeah. it, it is a good movie or it is a good premise. If my complaint is, Oh man, I wanted more of the two main characters interacting. Yeah. Cause, cause I liked it so much when they did. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it left me wanting more. Yes, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, uh, it's on Netflix right now. Um, but I think it's leaving at the end of the month. So you yeah. got to tell you got to tell them to watch it if you're interested. Yeah, since it's a Universal film, I'm going to wager that it's probably going to go back to Peacock. Yeah, pretty quick if it isn't already there. So yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think we've uh, exhausted all of our topics for tonight. Indeed, we have. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We appreciate it, as always. Um, you know, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, hit the bell, all the, you know. Uh, all the YouTube-friendly things. Uh, maybe drop us a comment. Yes, indeed. Uh, and uh, we will see you next week. Good night, everybody. Good night.